our fourth session in a series called Remodel, uh, in part of our larger series talking about revangelism. And remodeling is what happens to the believer, the, the, the biblical process of transformation that we need to undertake, we need to understand, one, to be able to see it happen in our own lives, two, to be able to benchmark it and understand that process in the lives of the people we're sharing the gospel with. Now, a big part of that is, of course, rethinking and getting our minds wrapped around what the Bible really says versus what traditional teaching has always led us to believe. So um, just kind of out of necessity, we want, found ourselves in the first three chapters of Genesis uh, at the end of last session, and we were dealing with this whole traditional narrative of did God put the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden to test man? And then we said that doesn't, that doesn't rationally compute with the rest of the narrative. God just got done declaring humanity very good, and God's not inconsistent. He called us good. He doesn't need to test whether or not we're good. And we looked at Genesis 2.9, which shows that God didn't put the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden. They just were there. And so the question came up, well, if your um, thesis is that Satan caused the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or Lucifer caused the tree of knowledge of good and evil to be there, the thesis was there, he wanted to perpetuate something, he understood the principles that God created everything after its own kind, and that if he wanted to perpetually separate man from God, he would have to create a seed that was contrary to the seed God had created in man, and see that perpetuated in his life. We see this walked out from the concept of the, the first prophecy in the gospel, the fact that the seed of the woman would crush the, seed, the head of the seed of the serpent, that, that it is an issue of seed, just like all things there. But how does the devil, who's not a creative being, a being who cannot create things from nothing, who can only pervert something God has already created, how does he create a tree? Okay, how, how, does, how does that happen? Again, you have to familiarize yourself with what the book actually says, because you're implying what you think is in the book, that it had to be created, that it wasn't um, simply perverted. And this is the answer. So if we jump back into Genesis, we will go back to chapter 1, okay? And we will look at verse 11, where it says, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. It is Genesis Chapter 1, verse 11, where God speaks plant life as we know it into existence from nothing. That's that creation. That's not what's happening in Genesis chapter 2. If we go over to Genesis chapter 2, The begin, uh, chapter 2, verse 8, which we read last time, it says, Then the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. There's no speaking existence out of nothing in the creation of the Garden of Eden. This was an intimate creation. The Garden of Eden, those words in the Hebrew literally means a, a pleasurable bridal enclosure. It was a place he was creating to house the, the most special of all of his creations, humanity. And the verbiage here in the Hebrew is saying that God literally took from what he had already created, took the finest of all things, dug in the dirt, much like he sculpted the dirt to create man in the first place, because man's creation was different than everything else that was created. It wasn't just spoken and it says God got on his hands and knees, sculpted the earth, and then breathed into him the breath of life. There's more than just speak, speaking something into existence going on there. Well, 2.8 says he planted a garden. The verb in the Hebrew implies God took already existing trees, 
like going to the landscaping lot and saying, I want one of these and one of these and one of these and two of these. And he brought them together and he planted a garden. So having taken from what was already spoken into existence, it's easy for the devil to take something already created and to pervert it. Because that's all he can do. Okay? That's the, that's the reality. It is completely rational within the context of the Scripture to say that that tree could have been put there by the devil because there were already trees in existence. And all he had to do was take the principles and the concept that God had created for mankind, mankind's benefit and protection and twist it into something that looked like it was good for food and then tempt them with the reason God doesn't want you to have this is because he says in the day that you eat of this, you will become like God. And what's the lie? The lie isn't that God didn't want mankind to be like God. The lie was they already were. We were created in his image. In fact, the lie goes on to say that you will be like God in that you will know good and evil. And the tricky part of that verse is the fact that we didn't need to know evil because to know evil was to exist in a place where God wasn't because God arbitrates what is good. And as we've said, good and evil aren't opposites. Evil is the op absence of good. The only way for us to know evil would be to know what it is like in the absence of God. And that's how come it became self-knowledge. The enemy put into a verbiage, a parlance, something that sounded like what God had said but wasn't really what God had said, and convinced Adam to function on his own apart from the knowledge that God had intended him to experience life through. And in so doing, that's where we get to what happened after the fall. Because that lie, that's it, that you, he says, you will not surely die. God says you eat of this tree and you will die. What happened? Obviously, Adam didn't keel over, have X's on his eyes, and start foaming at the mouth the moment he bit that tree. The Bible says he lived 900-some years. That's a pretty long life. I would consider that the opposite of death. So how does this tree reap death in our lives? It reaps death because spiritual death was instantaneous. Spiritual death happened immediately. In Genesis 2.17, when God tells Adam that eating of the tree of knowledge would cause him to surely die, obviously he didn't keel over immediately, but death entered the world immediately. How do we know death entered the world immediately? What happens when God finds out that Adam and Eve had eaten of the tree? Genesis 3.21, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Last I checked, you can harvest a sheep for wool, but if you harvest a sheep for skin, you're going to get one harvest. Let's put it this way. Who was the first person in the Bible to kill something? God. Adam and Eve thought it would be enough to clothe themselves in fig leaves. God said, no, you have to be clothed with the shedding of blood. See, death entered the world because of what they did. Spiritual death is something that we have a hard time understanding because it's intangible. But moreover, one of the things I want you to think about is where do we get this idea that God punished Adam and Eve for their sin? 
Genesis 3.21 says he made a sacrifice and covered them with skins. That's where they learned of the first atoning sacrifice. That skin had to come from somewhere. And he did that moments after explaining the consequences of their actions. God was merciful in the Old Testament, and he's still merciful today. But spiritual death was unavoidable. In the Greek, used here uh, in the, the Septuagint version, and it's, I, I use the Greek simply because it's these, this term for death, and this term, this, these verses about being born again, those are New Testament ver verses. So I'm using the, the, the Greek, the New Testament is in the Greek, so I'm using the Greek translation of the Old Testament here just to give us some comparatives. It's Strong's 2288. The word is Thanatos. The word is Thanatos. And it means to die, but it carries more than just the physical death. It implies the spiritual death that causes separation from God. And what you need to see is look at the history of man in Genesis after this moment. If you study Genesis 4, God explains the consequences of what Cain has done and Cain runs away from God. God marks Cain and protects him. But Cain runs away from God. When Cain cries out and says, my punishment is too much for me, it's actually Cain that says, I'm the one who will be a fugitive and a vagabond. God never said that. Cain runs away. What about humanity trying to push God away at the Tower of Babel? Genesis 11 says that this tower was in the heavens. If you study Greek mythology, you can trace that back to the Tower of Babel, and you come upon this one titan, this one God, whose job it was, when we think of him, we think of him as having the world on his shoulders. That's where we get the, the concept. His name is Atlas in the Greek. But if you study the actual myth, you'll see him portrayed on the sculptures of the Parthenon. He's near the peak of the building, and, and his hands, you don't see a globe at all. His hands are pushing away the top of that building so that Zeus and Hera, fallen man, fallen Eve, can stand at the precipice of the Parthenon. What Atlas is really doing is pushing away the God of the heavens, making room for the fallen ones to stand on their own. And of course, in Exodus 19, the Israelites want Moses to go to God for them at Sinai. They say, you go to God, you find out what he wants to say, and we'll do whatever he says, but we don't want to get any closer. In the Old Testament, what you can track from beginning to end is from the incident of sin, you can track man's departure from God and God's attempts to bring man back to himself ultimately culminating like he knew it would in the need for a Messiah see in Genesis at the fall man's nature changed the seed he was of changed make the, the uh, case for eating watermelon. Don't swallow the seeds. Ingest the seeds, you'll become like it. <laughs> That's what they did. They ate the fruit of that tree. They ingested that perverted seed. Of course, I'm joking, but the, uh, they, they, they ingested that perverted seed and it became their nature. Spiritual death was instantaneous and physical death ultimately resulted from it. But you could make the argument because of Genesis 3.21 that they didn't die immediately. Why didn't Adam and Eve die immediately? People make, you know, God, God, they didn't die immediately. Why didn't they die immediately? Because God made an atoning sacrifice for them. If God had not killed that first lamb or that first bull and covered them in its skin, the wages for their sin would have been death. Why don't people get that? Well, God lied. It didn't kill him immediately. It killed something immediately. 
How did, how did Cain and Abel know that God required sacrifices in Genesis 4? How did Abel know that it required a sacrifice of blood and not just the first fruits of Cain's offering? He learned it from what his parents taught him. You get to Genesis. Genesis, Abraham was take, told to take how many onto the ark? Two of every kind? No. Two of every kind and seven of the clean animals. Why? So that there would be enough for sacrifice. Question for you. How did, Abra or how did, uh, how did Noah know what was clean and unclean? The division of clean and unclean animals doesn't come until way after the flood, all the way until after Moses, Mount Sinai, Leviticus. That's when the divisions are given. How did Noah know? Because God brought to him seven of the clean, two of the unclean. Showed him what was necessary for sacrifice. They think death didn't come into the world. Death came into the world immediately. But God was a God of mercy, and yet we allow, I'm sorry, I'm getting fired up here, we allow the traditional narrative to say that God was so honked off because of man's sin that he pushed them out of the garden angry when the very first thing he did was atone for their sin and make promise of not just a covering atonement, but an ultimate purging when he said the seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. Can you defend the nature and character of God in the Old Testament? Because if you can't, you're no disciple of Christ. That'll take a lot. So, after the fall, the soul was exalted to the place of prominence. Spirit gets last place because they're spiritually dead. They're separated from God. Body takes second place because there's lots of people who are five cents ruled, their physical existence at what comes first, but their self-life, their suki cost, their mind, their will, and their emotions are what's in charge. Sean made an interesting point during the break. He says, you know, I could see that diagram working differently, that, that it could, for, for the intellectual people in this world, the, the rationalists, the thinkers, that the fallen mind could still, or the fallen man could still start in the mind and, and then move through their choices because they negate emotions. They're, they're like Spock from Star Trek. They think emotions are, are not um, part of the intelligent lifestyle. But see, the problem with that is if you actually watch their lives, they're still emotional beings. Spock was still an emotional being. That was his whole problem and his whole character arc that he had to deal with. See, the thing that we don't realize, and the reason I said most people who operate in a suki cost soul-led world that starts with their emotions and then moves to their minds and then goes through and affects their choices is because studies have, have dictated that 95% of all the choices you make are subconscious decisions that never contact your rational mind. Only 5% of the choices, you, when, you, when you get up and you decide what you're going to do first thing in the morning, you receive information from your body and you make an unconscious decision. You don't even really think about it. You go in and use the bathroom first thing in the morning when you get it, you know, whatever it is. Your feelings about do I want to eat an apple? Do I want to eat pasta? Do I want to? It oftentimes doesn't become a conscious choice because the things that you desire, the things that you crave, it automatically takes off. You know you like ice cream. You know you don't like wheatgrass. Boom. It's not even a, you know, it's not even a, a choice. The only time it becomes a choice is when you get the audacity to go to Japan and you see shrimp-flavored ice cream and you go, ooh, i got to think about this one. You know? What the heck? 5% of your choices are the rational, conscious choices that we make every day. And you could make the argument that soulish-led people do that thinking differently, sure, but for most of us, the choices that we make reign in our emotions. And so the soul takes the place of prominence because in the absence of a spirit, 
sustained in accordance with the original design of God, the soul, along with its independent knowledge of good and evil, became exalted. In other words, it became the primary driving force behind the decisions of mankind. And this is why Jesus is so focused on the death of the soul. It has to be put to death in order for the restoration of God's initial design. 1 John 3.16 says, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. I'm going to throw a monkey wrench in your thinking on that verse. When we think he laid down for his life for us, what do we think? We think he died on the cross, right? When it says he laid down his life, the word in the Greek is suke. He laid down his soul for you. The self-life of Christ was laid down way before he was ever nailed to a cross. Last week we ended saying this whole mess started in a garden. And I submitted to you that the ultimate battle was finished in a garden. That the real battle was already completed by the time Christ was arrested in Gethsemane. Because it is in that place where we see Jesus taking three of his disciples and saying, will you not wait with me? And you can see the soul life taking place here because all of us, when we go through the hardest things in life, that's the moment where we wish there was somebody who could just walk through it with us. And that's the moment we're married, unmarried, tons of friends, totally popular, or that guy who was never popular and doesn't have any friends. It doesn't matter. There's no difference between us. But the reality is, we all walk through that place alone because when it comes to the battle with the soul, nobody can walk with you. And that's really exemplified for us in Jesus' trial in Gethsemane. He takes his closest disciples, and what do they do? They fall asleep on the, you know, when he has to go off and do his own thing. He says, can't you wait for me just one hour? How many times has it has ever felt like the, even the people you're closest to, when you're going through the hardest thing that you have, they just fail to come through for you? It's because the battle of the soul is a battle you're always going to fight alone until, of course, you walk to that place where you're with the Father. And what did Jesus do in that garden? He said, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass through. If there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. Do you think he wanted to be beat? Do you think he wanted to go through a bunch of trials where his character and integrity were going to be insulted and they were going to call him liar? Do you think he wanted to stand before essentially bags of dirt and hear them tell him that his father wasn't who he said it was? Do you think there wasn't part of his emotions that wanted to rise up? Did you realize I spoke you into existence? Do you realize I can unspeak you into it? That uh, everything that exists exists because I hold it together with the word of my power, and all I have to do is break my covenant. So Jesus knew standing in that garden there was no other way. And he laid down his suke, his mind, his emotions, his feelings, and he made a choice. And that's why it says that he was so stressed that he literally sweat blood because laying down self is hard. But that's what he laid down. Because if he hadn't laid down self, I got news for you. It wasn't nails that kept him on that cross. 
He says, don't you know that I could call 12 legions of angels? Germany is a legion? 6,000 in a Roman legion. One angel, one night after dinner, walked through the camp of the enemies of the Lord and slayed 185,000 men. You do not mess with angels. And Jesus says, don't you realize I could call 12 legions, thousands upon thousands of these to come and rescue me? See, it wasn't nails that kept Jesus on the cross. It was his love for you and me that held him there. That was the only thing that kept him on that cross. Matthew 10, 39 says, He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake, will find it. You know the word translated life in the Greek? Suke. He who finds his soul is going to lose it. Why? Because if you're led by the soul, that means you're not led by the Spirit because McFly, they're not the same thing. And if you lose your life, your thoughts, your emotions, and the right to make choices that are contrary to his word for his sake, you will find eternal life. I bet you I can make that case again. John 12, verses 24 and 45. It says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, FYI, what's a grain of wheat? It's a seed. We're still dealing with seed here. It says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. He who loves his suke will lose it. But he who hates his suke in this life will gain eternal zoe. Zoe in the Greek is the God kind of life or life as God experiences it. If you give up your soul, you give up your thoughts, your way of doing things, your emotions, your right to feel indignant, angry, sad, depressed, Did you choose my word? Because my disciples abide in my word? Then you will reap life as God experiences it. See, internal self-knowledge corrupted our reality. And so now what we wind up doing is weighing one fruit against the other. Is this good? Is this bad? But self-righteousness and sin are still just fruit of the same tree. This is where most people miss it. The good side of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is just as deadly as the evil side. There is no life in that tree. The good side is rooted in self, man's way, man's thoughts, man's reasons. Neither independent good nor independent evil can prosper man eternally. Foundationally, they are results from sin. And it is this independent man, incapable of accessing the life-sustaining, transformative, creative power of the Spirit of God that is basically evil, according to the biblical worldview. And we talked about that in Rethink. That according to the biblical worldview, man is basically evil. 
Why? Because even the best of your good is still self-good. It's not spirit good. The best that you can do is still best according to a knowledge of good and evil that comes from you and not God. That's why, according to the spiritual principles of change we looked at in the first part of this section, God says, I will give you a new spirit and I will cause you to walk in my commandments. I will cause you to keep my statutes. How do I know that God didn't have to test to see if man would would eat of that tree or not? Because the Spirit was in him. Why do you think the devil had to tempt Eve? She hadn't gotten direct revelation. If you think for a minute that you can subsist by going to church on a Sunday morning and having me or some other preacher pour the Word of God, no matter how much revelation of it they have into your life without studying it, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, making it a part of your life, abiding in it, then you are subsisting on hand-me-down revelation and you will always, 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 always have a propensity towards deception. You won't be able to discern between this teacher's teaching and that teacher's teaching because you'll violate the Berean mandate of Acts 17.11 which says those in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they received the word of God but they tested it to see if the scriptures really said it was so. The serpent will always try to corrupt those who do not have direct revelation from God. Always. So we come to the last part of this spirit, soul, and body thing. Why have we taken so much time with it? Why have we tried to do you, do you think that I have made the case within the scriptures that the spirit and the soul are not the same thing am I making that up you wonder why 80 percent I mean remember that statistic we had at the beginning of, of this remodeled section where it said 80 percent of Americans claim to be Christian okay forget that for a second because we know there's tons of people who just say eh, I'm Christian I'm not Buddhist I'm not Catholic. I you know, really don't take that yoga stuff that seriously, so I guess I'm not Hindi. So I must be Christian. There is no Christian yoga, by the way. But let's take the ones who actually have had an experience where they've gone down to an altar, they've asked Jesus to be the, the, the center of their life, they've, they've prayed the center, sinner's prayer with Pastor Jimmy. They were at big citywide revival 2011, 2012, 2013. They've rededicated their lives. for Why don't they change? It's because most churches do not accurately convey from the Scriptures the biblically ordained means of supernatural transformation. Because they think two words are synonymous. They think two words can be used interchangeably. And they can't. The Word of God is living and powerful and divides between the division of the soul and the spirit. Why do you think he says to those who believe, you are my disciples, if you abide in my word. It's because if you abide in my word, you will know the difference between what's your self-life and what's me moving in your life. You cannot subsist on hand-me-down revelation. It violates the principle of spirit and truth. So then we come to this word, 
And the word is heart. Because you're going to see it throughout the Bible. The word is leb in Hebrew. In Greek, it is cardia. It's where we get cardiovascular. Okay? And unfortunately, the term heart is one that if you do not study it for yourself, you can get really confused. So I encourage you all, seeing as you've just been schooled on the, van, the, the advantages of personal, first-hand revelation from God, to embark upon a word study. Go to blueletterbible.com or open your Strong's Concordance, search the term heart, and just go through the scriptures. Scripture by scripture. Go to them, read them in context, see what's there. Because what you're going to see is sometimes the word heart is used to mean soul, and sometimes the word heart is used to mean spirit. See, now we're getting to the root of where the confusion comes from. Well, they can both be the same thing. No. You've got to look at the scriptures carefully. And I'm going to give you a key, a tool, to understanding this that I think will be helpful to you as you do this word study. But this is your homework for this week. This is your homework after you listen to this session. See, our own efforts don't allow us to separate ourselves from the self-knowledge that came from that tree. And no, nor can we renew our minds to the truth of how we were originally created to be. Jeremiah 17.9 points us out when it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Well, what's it talking about? In Deuteronomy 2.30, and I'm not going to take the time to go there, you're going to see in that verse that the terms spirit and heart are used independently in the same sentence. Your spirit is such and your heart is such. Ooh, okay. So obviously the heart and the spirit aren't necessarily the same exact thing or the Bible wouldn't have the need to use both terms in one phrase. Does that make sense? Okay, can we do that the other way? Well, same book of the Bible, Deuteronomy 4.29, you'll see the term soul and the term heart used in the same sentence independently. Well, obviously they can't be the same thing or the Bible wouldn't take the time to use both terms in the same sentence. Make sense? How often have we learned people like to say, well, do you take the Bible literally? And then what they try to do to you is they can, well, what about, what about this part of Scripture where it's got to be a, you know, it's got to be a part of speech. You know, you believe, you believe, you know, that... Uh, that God has feathers, <laughs> or whatever, you know, because he has wings. It says he keeps you under the shadow of his wing. I don't believe God has feathers. It's obviously a, a part of speech referencing God as a hen brooding over her chicks. Okay, I get that. So we don't want to get the Bible's full of parts of speech. Saying you take the Bible literally all the time is, is not the best way to say it. How about we take the Bible seriously? It means what it, he, God means what he says, and he says what he means, and we treat it precisely. Because every time we treat the Bible more precisely, we're rewarded with deeper understandings. Okay? Those are great terms when you get into arguments with an atheist, by the way. Let's go back to Genesis. We're going to skip forward to Genesis 6, 5. And I want you to see something here. A couple of verses that are good examples of this heart issue we're talking about. Genesis 6, 5 says, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Was man's spirit evil? No, he was spiritually dead at this point. This is post the fall. He's spiritually separated from God. He is incapable of receiving spiritual information. So the heart here has to be talking about man's elevated soul. 
In fact, the thoughts of his heart, it even implies soul from the, it's only evil continually. The thoughts of his heart. Well, where's the thoughts come out of? His mind, right? Look at the next verse. 6.6 6 says, And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Is God's heart only evil continually? No. God is a spiritual being, right? He still has some soulish qualities. He can be angry. He can be, he can be happy. He can dance over his children, all of those things. But you see, there's just this confusion in this word heart. What does it mean? Does it mean soul or does it mean spirit? How do we make sense of this when we look at what the Bible is talking about? Genesis 8:21 and the Lord smelled the soothing or yeah and the Lord smelled the soothing aroma this is when Noah is giving a sacrifice to God after the flood and then the Lord said in his heart I will never again curse the ground for man's sake although the imaginations of man's heart is evil from his youth nor again destroy every living thing as I have done God says in his heart talking about the imaginations of man's heart Wait a minute what does this term mean? What's the, what's, 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 the, what's the point here? See, the heart is often described as a place where internal dialogue takes place. You said in your heart. You thought in your heart. It's the place where emotions are experienced. We're obviously describing very suke, very soulish things here. But Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will take out of you the heart of stone and I will put in you a heart of flesh. I will put in you a new spirit. Well, he's actually talking about this heart transplant here. So this new spirit gets put into man's heart and it's this spirit that causes him to keep the statutes, to keep the commandments. See, I find it helpful to think about the heart like this. What do we, what do we know about the heart? Well, the physical heart has two sides. It has two sides composed of two chambers each. One side is the portion where blood that has been depleted of oxygen comes back and is oxygenated from an external source and then pumped out throughout the body. And the other part Blood comes back and then blood is cycled into the other half to be sent back out through the body. Unoxygenate, unoxygenated blood, inoxygenated blood. Blood that receives the life-giving breath. Wait a minute. Ruach, breath, wind, life, spirit. And blood that has not received the oxygenating breath, wind, blood, spirit. Can you imagine the devastation that would happen in your physical heart if it started returning unoxygenated blood back into your body? You need both sides, all chambers of this one organ to be functioning in order to sustain life. You need it to happen. And Jesus makes these points really clear. We can't live spiritually unless our quote-unquote hearts have a means of accessing our external life of God via the spirit chambers. Our minds, our will, our emotions have to function in conjunction with our spirit, separate, yet equally important parts. Consistently, we can see the heart can become hardened in the Old Testament. And nowhere in the Bible do you ever see a heart being healed. A heart 
has to be replaced. Ezekiel 36, 26. It has to be physically changed. A couple of required verses on this as we had to a close. There's this big discussion that Jesus has with the Pharisees in most of the Gospels where he says, what is the greatest commandment? And of course, they reply out of Deuteronomy 6, 5, which says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. First off, what was the condition of man when God gave the Ten Commandments? Were they new creatures? New cre creatures regenerated by a new spirit that had been put inside of them? Or they're fallen creatures who needed a process of atonement that was a shadow of and a rehearsal for the coming of the Messiah that would make them be born again. Uh, I think they were the latter. Well, what is God saying in Deuteronomy 6.5? He's saying, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And most people teach that you're looking at three, well, your heart is, is, is your mind and your soul is your eternal. I've heard such, such confusing teachings on this. Your heart's your mind and your personality and all of these things, but, but your soul is that eternal spiritual part of you and your strength is your effort. And they, they teach this very confusingly. Let's, let's look at it from what we understand from spirit, soul, and body. I want you to love me with all of your heart, and inside that heart, I command your love to come from all of your soul, which is a part of that heart. And it has to happen with all of your strength. I bet we can flesh that out further if we look at what Jesus actually says. Because remember, we want to treat the Bible with precision. And I think it's very, very cool when we treat the Bible with precision. Matthew twenty-two twenty-seven. 27 Jesus, when they ask Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus says to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Your heart has your spirit and your soul. He's talking to unregenerate people who don't believe in him. You have to Love him with all of your soul, which is a portion of your heart. And of that soul that's made of your mind, your will, and your emotions, you're going to have to love him with all of your mind. The scripture isn't talking about three separate and independent things. It's zeroing in on a target. Now you notice, well, Jesus didn't quote it the way that it's actually said in Deuteronomy. What's the deal with that? Let's take a look at a couple of the other Gospels. They record it slightly differently. Mark 12.30 says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Because putting down your soul is hard. It takes effort. A lot of effort. One more, let's take a look at Luke. And so he answered and said to them in Luke 10, 27, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. He reverses them in this version of it. And your neighbor is yourself. This is the greatest commandment. What do we know about the Old Covenant law? It was a ministry of death and condemnation. The whole point of the Old Testament was to show them God's standard of perfection. What do we know about all the commandments? Well, we know that in the, in the Torah itself, there were 613 commandments distilled down into 10 commandments. And what we're dealing with here in Deuteronomy 6.5 is the commandment that they're saying is the greatest commandment. 
What we know about all of the commandments is that in and of himself, mankind couldn't accomplish them without a Savior. What's the picture? Without being spiritually reborn. What does Jesus say to Nicodemus in John chapter 3? Unless you are born of the Spirit, you won't see the kingdom of heaven. The picture to walk away from this confusing topic of heart is as much as you may try to love Jesus with all of your mind, and as much as you may use your emotions and your will to make choices that you're going to be a believer for God, you cannot love God with all of your heart when there is a half of that heart that's spiritually dead unless Jesus is your Savior and you are being transformed through a biblical means of supernatural transformation. You need the Spirit. Because the soul can't do it on its own. Look at it another way. If you have the Spirit on the inside of your heart, then when your soulish half of your heart is functioning correctly, your mind, your thoughts are being constantly renewed by being siphoned through that spiritual portion of your heart that receives direct revelation from the Spirit of God. And then as it comes back into your emotions and your will, that soulish half of you, it's empowered from something outside of you. And your heart can function like it was designed to function. clears up a lot of confusion, doesn't it? It's almost like God wrote his word to make sense. It takes our genius to screw it up. So my prayer for you guys as you do your studies this week, that you would come close come closer to really understanding that unless you have the whole thing reconstructed by God on the inside of you, this transformation process will never take place. But I want you to see is how we break this stuff down, how we break it down into understandable components that don't contradict themselves throughout Scripture because of faulty terminology, what it allows you to do is look into the life of somebody you're discipling and go, the mind's not quite right. The emotions are in control. The choices aren't being affected. They don't have an understanding that they're transformed by the Spirit. It's almost like you can benchmark the process of discipleship according to the Word. Go figure. 25 years ago, this month, something very important happened in history. A certain movie changed all of the pop culture references I would ever use. It is important for us to understand how to enact this biblical process of transformation that we understand how to go back to the future. We've got to get back to the original design in order to progress into the future that God has for us. And next week, we're going to take a look at how the Bible says that works in our lives. Okay?